If you're going to worship with him, preach with him, get along with him, clap your hands real good right now. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, I like what I feel in this place tonight. Amen. It's a wonderful, wonderful spirit of the Lord. I come to tell somebody tonight, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself because I'm anxious to share what I have with you now, but I'm come to tell somebody tonight that you're a blessed people. Blessed. I said that we are a blessed people. Amen. God has been good to us. Amen. He, he's, he smiled his favor on us, and he has been good to us, and I'm thankful for that. Brother Shannon, 1 Chronicles 4 and 1, and it says, The sons of Judah, Perez, Hezron, and Carmi, and Hur, and Shobal. And it goes so on, and it goes so forth. It is a list of genealogies, Brother Billy. It is a list of he begots, and who begots, and sons, and so forth. And then we, then we get to 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand, that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldst keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. Very important part right here. And God granted him that which he requested. God answered his prayer. It was a prayer of faith, Brother Johnny. It was a prayer of hope, and it was a prayer of promise. And the Bible says that God answered his prayer. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. It says, Ask, and it shall be given. You seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Yes. That's a promise that God has given to us. Amen. That is a promise that God has given to us. My lesson tonight is titled simply, Blessed by the King. Yes. Blessed by the King. This, this prayer that we read, this prayer of Jabez, and that's how I'm going to pronounce it tonight. I might wind up saying Jabez or Jabez before it's all said and done. But this prayer by Jabez has been made into a, a book by a man by the name of Bruce Wilkinson, Sister Judy. And his main focus is, is to pray and ask for God's prosperity on your life. God's blessings on your life, Sister Margaret. And he really kind of overemphasizes the miracles and the financial blessings. And I will tell you tonight that I'm a firm believer. Don't get me wrong, Brother Marcus. I've got faith and I believe that God can do anything that we ask. Yes, one, of, one of Brother Pete's favorite scriptures is Matthew 6 and 33. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you. But we've got to do our part, Sister Eloise. We've got to seek after God. We've got to ask of God, as the scripture has said. Ephesians 3 and 20 tells us, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can even ask or think according to the power that worketh in me. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. Brother Johnny, that's praying, that's praying with faith. That's believing that God can do anything. I'm not going to put any kind of a limit on him, if you will. And, and, and I believe, and I'm speaking for myself, there, that there are times in our life when we live outside the blessings of God. Yes, amen. That we live outside the blessings of God and what He would like to do in our lives. And it's, it's not always about the financial part. When we think about the blessings of God, Sister Judy, we like to think about the financial parts. But a lot of the times it's the spiritual parts. It's the mental parts. It's the things that God can give us besides money. Yeah, it's not always about money. Amen. Amen. Both healings in our body, both physical and mental. There's times that we need this mental mind healed, right? These are some of the blessings that God can give to His people. And sometimes it's not always granted to us. Sometimes, Brother Jill, it might be because of sin. Sometimes it might be because of a lack of faith. Sometimes it might be see, because we simply don't ask. Simply don't ask. Sometimes we even ask amiss. We don't ask what we really need of God. And we got to be specific, Brother Doyle. We've got to ask him specifically what we, what we have, to, have to have in our life. Yeah. Jabez is one of these, these people that kind of, uh, these characters, 
characters that appear in the pages of the scripture out of nowhere. Here's the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 4 is listing all these genealogies of all these people. And then all of a sudden we read these two passages of scripture about Jabez. He's kind of like that diamond that you find in a coal mine that's been formed under the pressure and the extreme temperature and the heat that they've had to endure. The only reference to the man in this passage of 1 Chronicles 4.19 of the book of Chronicles is littered with names of men and women about whom we know very little. Right. Their names mentioned and then it's passed on. For some, we may only know their fathers and son or the tribe that they belong to and little else. However, the fact that their name appears in the scripture is important. Jabez is one of these, he's not just one of these characters that a small fragment or a single verse is devoted to. He's got two verses devoted to him. Neither is he a man like King David that has chapter after chapter detailing his life and his experience with God. Right. Yeah. However, in these two small verses that we read, we'll find a wealth of information. There's some, there's some very valuable and rewarding lessons, Brother Gio, that we find about this man by the name of Jabez. Sure. Amen. The early chapters of 1 Chronicles are genealogies, a list of names of all the descendants of the different tribes. Chapter 4 focuses on the tribe of Judah. That was the tribe of praise. That that's what the name means. Judah means praise. It's also the tribe that would bring forth the Messiah, Jesus, the true son of David, the rightful king of Israel, would come out of the tribe of Judah. That was, that was the inheritance that belonged to Jabez. Right. That was the inheritance that belonged to him. One commentary I read said that either his mother had him out of wedlock or that Jabez's father was so evil his name was not included in the genealogies because it does not list his father. It does not tell us his father's name, Brother Marcus. Some names in that, in that day were omitted because they were evil people and their names were not included in the genealogies. Whatever reason, whatever reason there is, there's no mention of his father's name. It was his mother that named him and given him a name, Jabez. And that name Jabez means sorrow. Right. That name Jabez means sorrow. He makes me sorrowful. I gave birth to him in pain. There was something about what she went through when she had this little boy that she hung this name on him, Jabez. And it was a name that would stick with him. It was a name that meant sorrow. He had to go through life with this name. He had to face life with a name that he brought sorrow to his mother. And just, just kind of looking at this, we can, kind of, we can kind of find out where this time frame fits in that. We can deduct from the position of his genealogy in accordance with others in this same passage of Scripture, this general context. In uh, verse 4 and 13, we find Athenial, which is the nephew of Caleb, which tells us that in Joshua 15 and 17. And the importance of this, the reason that we need to know where he fit in at, where his time frame was at, was because of what was going on during that time. The generational living of Jabez was from the time during the wars for possession of the land until the time of partial possession in the book of Judges. The spiritual condition of Israel in the time of Judges is given to us in Judges 2.10. It says, After the death of Joshua, there arose a generation who did not know the Lord. This was the time period this young man was living in. There arose a generation who did not know the Lord. It's, it's further repeated in, in Judges 5.11. The sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It is into this generation and into this culture that we find, we, we find Jabez. And the Bible says that he was more honorable or more noble than his brothers was. He was, he was different than his brothers. He was different from the generation that he lived in in general. There was something different about this young man. Like Enoch in the days of uh, uh, Genesis 5 and 22, he obviously knew the Lord. There was some teaching there to where he knew the Lord. There was something that had taken place in his life and let him know that God was the one that he needed to call on and God was the one that he needed to depend on. How many know that's true tonight? Yes, yes. They're the ones that we, he's the one that we need to depend on. I want to try to break down the life of Jabez, and it, it, like I said, it's just two verses, but there's a wealth of information here for us. We are told that at childbirth, the very moment, Sister Kim, that he was born into this world, his mother named him Jabez. 
which means sorrow. She took all the disappointments and pain of that experience and she put it on her son. She tagged him with that name. In effect, she cursed him and he grew up with a name that brought nothing but frustration and shame into his life. Possibly a negative effects of his name played out into his life. In those days, Bible names were of great importance. They reflected things like character. They reflected things like destiny. They reflected the calling that the people had on their life. So within the scripture, we, we find many different change. Names were, names were changed. Brandon, there's many different things, many different individuals that had their name changed. We find Abram, which means high father. His name was changed to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Sari, which means my princess to Sarah, which means lady. Saul's name meant ask or pray for, and we find that it was changed, Brother Terry, to Paul, which means small or humble. Jacob, one of the most familiar characters that we, that we read about in the Bible, had a name change. That name that he was given means surplanter or deceiver. He cheated his brother out of his birthright. But his name was changed to Israel. Yes. We know the story where he wrestled with the angel all night long and he would not let go until God blessed him, Sister Eloise. And his name was changed to Israel because he, he was a prince. He had kingship entitlement, if you will. He had power with God and with men because he had prevailed. A name change in the Bible days indicated a destiny that God wanted them to walk in. It was something that took place, something that, that changed in their life. They were no longer identified by their old name. They were identified by a new name. Right. I begin to look at that. I begin to think about, about Jabez. Why, why did he still have to keep the same name? Why did he have to keep the same name? The Lord didn't change his name. It still stayed Jabez, which meant sorrow. He didn't change his name, but he changed the situation that he was in. Right. How many of you ever found, a, found out that you're in a situation in your life that you're no longer happy with and that you want to change? God can change that. God can change the circumstances. God can change the things that are going on in our life and the things that are happening in our life. We no longer have to keep going in that direction or that road because God can change it. He didn't change his name. He, be, he just changed the situation that he was in. He began life with a curse, but it did not end that way. I, I, Brother Gio, I've heard you talk and talk again about the boys at the boys' ranch. Those young men would come in there. A lot of them have trouble with lives. So a lot of them had gone through things that you and I can't even imagine in their life. And I've heard you talk about how they would say, my grandpa was bad, or my daddy was bad, or, yes. or my mama was bad, or my uncle was bad, so that's going to make me bad. Yes. We don't have to live like that. That's right. we, don't, we don't have to live like that. We don't never have to let our past define who we are. We don't never, especially when we come in contact with God, Sister Leanne. I said, when we come in contact with God, we do not have to let our past define who we are going to be in the present. We don't have to let it define who we are. It doesn't have to be that way. There, there's something that takes place, Brother Billy, when we become a child of God. We take on His name in baptism and we take on that new nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're given a clean slate. You're given a, a, a clean record, if you will. No longer will my past define who I am because I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. We do not have to let our past define who we are. We're given a clean slate. We can continue that way, Sister Maria, with the help of God. The Bible says Jabez called on the God of Israel. First and foremost, Brother G.L., it shows that he had a prayer life. Right. He preached about that Sunday night, about having a prayer life. Prayer changes things. Yeah. I said prayer changes things. Amen. He worshipped the God of Israel. There was, there was a desperation to his plea. James 5 and 16, the latter part of it, tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Right. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means you're getting down to business with God. Yes. 
It means that you mean business with God. There was something going on in his life. Jabez desired something greater in his life, and he knew that God was the one thing. I said he knew God was the one thing that could change his course in the destination that he was headed down. Man, I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad for that. That God can change us. That God can give us a new life. I'm so thankful for that. And so, sometimes I feel like a Christian, as a Christian, and I'm speaking for myself right now. We've kinda, we kind of have a tendency, Sister Amanda, to kind of lose the direction of our lives. And we live below the expectations that God has for us. He sees us differently than we see ourselves. He sees us in a different light than what we see ourselves. When we, we live, Brother Jill, below the expectations that God has for us. We're children of the King. He wants us to be able to see ourselves like He sees us. That's right. Walking in His power, walking in His glory, walking in what He wants us to do and what He has in store for us in our life. Jabez asked God for four specific things in this prayer. It says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that, that hand, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. That just, that just really does something to me when I read that last part, Brother Jill. And God granted unto him everything that he asked for. Everything that he needed, everything that he wanted in his life, Brother Johnny, God granted it to him. First, he prayed that God would bless him. Secondly, he prayed that God would enlarge his coast. Third, he prayed God's hand would be on his life. And fourth, he prayed that God would keep him from evil so he would not be grieved. Four very specific things that this young man wanted in his life. Four things. The first thing that he prayed was that God would bless him. A deep hunger for God's blessing in his life. And the key word here is bless. And some of you are fixing to laugh when I say this. But that word bless is from a Hebrew word spelled Barak. B-A-R-A-K. And I'm not talking about the president. But what it means, Brother Jill, it means that to kneel. There was something about his approach to God. When he approached God, there was a humbleness about him. There was a reverence about him. And that he kneeled in the presence of God and began to ask God for these things. He said, Lord, I sure do pray that thou would bless me. And if thou seest fit. One of the, one of the amazing things about this, how many of you pray, pray specifically? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. We do, we do that at times. But with this young man's pray, prayer, he did not specify the blessing or the blessing that he wants. He just said, oh Lord, that thou will bless me. Right. He didn't go into detail about it. He left that part of it up to God, of how God would bless him. How God would give him the things in his life that he felt like God needed to, to, to give him. He let God decide what the blessings were going to be in his life. Right. There's nothing wrong in asking that God bless us and our family. Nothing wrong for God to bless us and our family, right? He desires to give us his blessings. Psalms 34, 37 and 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight yourself in him. Ask of him. The second thing he prayed for was that God would enlarge his coast. And to enlarge means to grow. He was not satisfied with the status quo, if you will. He wasn't happy at where he was at. He wasn't satisfied at where he was at. He called on the God of his fathers, the God of Israel, a covenant of Israel. He cried out, Oh, that thou would bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. So blessings from God that it would enrich every area of his life, including the physical, the social, the material, and the spiritual. 
a prayer of prosperity, which there's nothing wrong with. He said, and enlarge my borders. He was an ambitious young man, but he had the right attitude, Brother Jim. Right. Lord, help me do a greater work for you, if you will. He's sincere. His prayer was for God to help him extend his possessions, to increase his wealth, to advance his influence. And it was not a prayer of selfishness. You know why I know? Because the Bible said God granted him that which he requested. God wanted him to have that. God wanted, wanted him to have that. We've got, to, we've got to learn how to pray specific things into our life. You're right. It's so easy, Brother Jill, sometimes, and I find myself doing it, and you've talked about it before, but it's to get down and pray and just begin to ramble. I like the prayer patterns that you've, you've taught us. I, I use the one for the tabernacle quite a bit when I'm praying. But there comes a time when we need specific things in our life, Brother Richard. We've got to ask God for the specific things that we need. What we need help with, what we, what we, what we need in our life. I'm going to tell you that God already knows what we, at, what we need, have need of before we ask. But there's times when he wants to hear us ask, Brother Marcus. There's times when he, he wants to see how bad that we really, really want it. The third thing he prayed for was that God's hand would be on his life. A prayer for power or strength. That that hand might be with me. He's asking for God's hand to be with him in all his endeavors and everything that he does in life. God, I want your hand to be on it. I want your hand to be on it. When we study about the potter and the clay, the secret to the potter and the secret to the vessel being made new again, to be made into a vessel of honor is the hands of the potter. That's right. It's very important that we understand that we need God's hand on our life. Psalms 1, 18 and 16 says, The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Begin to do a little study, begin to do a little looking at that, Brother Ray, and that word valiantly translates to a word called chael, C-H-A-Y-I-L. And it's, it, it is a word that means army. It is a word that means army, valiantly. Fifty-six times in the King James Bible it talks about Valiantly, it talks about God being an army ready to fight for us, Brother Jill. When you think about the, God's hand in our life and Him being an army ready to fight for us, that's pretty powerful when you stop and think about that. When you stop and think about that. I think, I think about the armies in the Bible and I think, about, I think about the battle of Jericho when you talk about they marched around the wall six days one time. The seventh day, they marched around it seven times. Right. Blew the trumpets and shouted, what happened? The walls fell down. Amen. I'm talking about the mighty hand of God yeah. in our lives. Amen. I'm talking about the mighty hand of God in our lives. I think about Gideon. Started out with what, 10,000 men? Yes. Wound up with 300. Yes, the Bible says that the army that he fought, the Midianites, were like grasshoppers on the hillside. Everywhere, everywhere you looked, these people were, these enemies, they were enemies, Just Maria. We know that Gideon took these 300 men, blew the trumpet, shattered the pitchers, and shouted. They began to fight among themselves and they began to destroy each other. I'm talking about the hand of God. The hand of God on people's lives. The hand of God on people's lives. We talk about Jehoshaphat. The Lord told him to go out and fight the battle. Does he send out his army on the front lines? No, he sends out the praise singers on the front line. He sends out the praise singers on the front line and the people begin to fight among themselves. And once again, they kill each other. Not a, not a weapon fired, not a shot fired. I'm talking about the mighty hand of God in our life. That army, Brother Mark, is fighting for us. That army that's on our side. How's this for a blessing? Promise originally to Israel. Isaiah 62 and 3 says, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of God, in His hands. In His hands. That's where we find ourselves at. Or this for the New Testament believers. 
talk about a security. John chapter 10 verses 27 through 29 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're in the palm of God's hand. The mighty hand of God is on our life. Nothing, nothing is going to be able to take us out of there. Nothing is going to be able to take us out of there, Brother Billy. We're always protected by the mighty hand of God. Jabez recognized that he could not succeed on his own. He humbled himself when he asked for God's blessings in his life. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The fourth thing he prayed to God for was to keep him from evil so he would not be grieved. A prayer of protection. And that thou wouldest keep me from evil. Matthew 6 and 13 The Lord's Prayer said, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. To be kept from evil and to be delivered from evil seems to be the same thing, at least in my mind. But let's check the Hebrew word for evil. It's parallel to the Greek word Jesus used, and both are active, malicious forms of iniquity. And iniquity is sin. Basically, it's spelt ra, R-A, and it means that which is wicked, bad, mischievous, hurtful, and naughty. Anything that can come against us and hurt us and our families. Whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, spiritual, whatever it could be, that which would come up against us, the evil of this world. We live in an evil day. Yes. We live in an evil world. I begin to look at this and I begin to think about this, Brother Johnny, and... uh, and I thought about Job. I, I, I thought about Job after I read this passage of Scripture. And, and Job chapter 1 verses 6 through 12 says this. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And that word escheweth there means he shuns evil. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. I said this quite often when I when I when I've read this passage of scripture, I thought, man, the Lord must have had a lot of faith in Job. The Lord must have had a lot of faith in Job, Sister Eloise. How would you like it if uh, he said, "Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Johnny?" <laughs> Consider my servant, Brother Billy. I don't know if I'd want that, Sister Michelle. But this shows how much faith, if you can believe God has faith, this shows how much faith God had in Job. That's right. That's right. How much that he knew the character of Job and he knew the man of Job, Brother McKinney. He knew what kind of man Job was. Now you think about this, Brother Marcus. The Lord had built a hedge or fence around Job and around everything that he owned. I'm talking about being protected from evil. This is the prayer that Jabez prayed. I want you to protect me from evil. And the Bible says that the Lord had built a hedge around Job and everything that he owned. Divine protection, if you will. God had blessed Job so much that the Bible says that he was the greatest man 
in the east, there was nobody like Job. Nobody like Job. The image that comes to my mind is that